for those of us who, you know, I mean, I think a term that people can identify with is uh, our empaths. I mean, I understand that differently through the trauma perspective, but let's just say empaths and super sensitive to everything, which I, I hold that, I hold that identity <laughs> <laughs> in a loving way, you know, um, yeah. then, you know, the idea of riding waves or pendulation or regulation is very comforting because in the past, like before I knew as much as I did about uh, trauma and my nervous system, it, it, it would only be ping ponging and the ping ponging would come from fear. Uh, fear mm -hmm. of the vast unknown or fear of the, you know, being a mere mortal. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast, where we explore life through the lens of somatics. I'm Luis Mujica, a somatic educator who teaches people how to find safety in themselves. Your turn to learn begins now. I'd like to welcome my friend Ann Connor to the podcast. Welcome, Ann. Thank you. Glad to be here. So we've had a couple conversations over the years that led to this episode. Um, and so I, we were talking before this and we thought it'd be a nice idea for me to kind of introduce our past, some of the transformations, and then we can kind of drop into the present and just kind of riff together, right? I love it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, so Anne and I both have the history of identifying with magic, with being a witch, with forms of Wicca and different ancestral lines of practicing witches that we come from. And that led us into these spaces where we find other people, other gatherings, beautiful ritual spaces, and so on. And then in the last, interestingly, for, for both of us in the last, I'll, I'll speak for myself, I don't know when it started for you, but it was like, I want to say eight years ago is what I, is my memory around the time where something in me started shifting. I was noticing um, in popular culture, the term witchy was being used a lot. Um, and it just meant like a scented candle. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then in- Different colors, yeah. <laughs> different different yeah. colors of scented candles uh, with, like a, with like a 2D crystal drawn on them. And, um, right. and in the spaces that you and I met in, I was noticing these different expressions, um, whether it was political or identity-based or just something that didn't really resonate with my body. And so I got really curious and I was like, why is this identity witch? Why is this term? Why is this lifestyle just not resonating anymore? And with the help of somatics, you know, going into my body, with the help of colleagues and indigenous elders and beautiful people that held space with me as I asked these questions, I started noticing that witch is really this adopted term, right? It's, it's a term that was made initially for division if we think of in Europe, if someone from the church said she's a witch, all that really meant was an indigenous European woman, you know, at the time. So Italian, French, Irish, whatever the land their body came from, they were still practicing the indigenous practices of their bloodline. And because it right. wasn't of the church, they were witches. Um, yeah. And we know what happened to them. So uh, I, as I was sitting with it, I was noticing, oh, which doesn't really work for me anymore because it's it's too much of like, um, it's almost like another construct, right? And I started feeling uh, bound by the construct instead of, ex you know, expanded, which originally it felt really expansive and I felt seen, but then I started feeling right. bound. So right. I learned for me, which was this beautiful invitation and initiation into these parts of my ancestry, these parts of myself. But then... The, especially I think of my friend Asha Frost, who's been on this podcast, she's used the term re-indigenizing. When I think of re-indigenizing in my bloodline, that has replaced me being a witch. Yeah. Um, and it brings up like Robin Wall Kimmerer's work in Braiding Sweetgrass, where she has that chapter about becoming a place. And she says, anybody can become indigenous to another land when they learn how to relate and speak and listen to the land they're on. And that's what I was always chasing with the witch identity. So mm -hmm. I'm just saying all this. So now we come to this present moment. Yeah. Here you are in front of me. We've had these discussions where you're like, oh, me too, me too. And you told me things. I'm like, me too, me too. So why don't we start unpacking this together and just kind of play with what, what emerges and tell me where you go sure. with everything I just said. 
Yeah, I was in my 30s and, um, and it was just exciting and liberating and uh, felt like, oh my God, I've found my tribe. Mm. And um, that was, it was so important to my ongoing development. And, um, and I also kind of, I liked, I liked the word, which it was a reclaiming for sure, because it's a powerful word and, um, and, and actually <laughs> conjures up a lot of feelings for people, but I really love how you have, uh, framed it, um, that it is a construct and, yeah, not really, not really one that works for me anymore. Um, and that what I've learned over time is that behind that construct of uh, sort of Western finger pointing at indigenous people, particularly women, um, you know, underneath that was this whole other history of just being an indigenous mm. Mm. woman in Western Europe who had a lot of knowledge of healing and uh, energy work and how to relate with people in a whole system, whole body way, and not to always be splitting between, you know, the head and the body. And that that really the essence of what was so exciting about the conversations and the sort of magic that happened at these gatherings is that we were meeting each other in a very whole system, whole body sort of way. And it was a place where I could continue to do um, this sort of mind body work. I called it that then, you know, this mind body work that was more whole that really I didn't feel was that need wasn't being met anywhere in the bigger culture, uh, not with psychotherapy, you know, not, not certainly not in any job that I held. Um, I was a teacher for a long time and, you know, brought this whole body, whole system awareness into the classroom with me. But amongst my colleagues or the school as a whole or systemic education, I didn't really find it. There was still just, just this split happening that over, over the years since I first started teaching just continued to get bigger and bigger rather than, you know, coming together and understanding yeah, the whole of a human being as they learn. So um, let's pause there for a minute. Sure. Because that, that's, I'm yeah. loving this so much. As you're speaking, I'm getting this clear sense of what Daniel Mate, who I had on a few episodes ago, was talking about around um, identity and construct can be helpful and unhelpful. And I'm, as I hear you talk about these gatherings and these spaces with people and this exploration of mind, body, and body land, and this like whole being relating with other people. That was my experience too. And what's so cool is the construct of which was really like a lighthouse for us. You know, it shone this light and we followed it because it looked like something that we felt until it didn't. So I, I like this example of how constructs can actually be helpful while you need that. If we think of something being constructed like a container, like it's like a Petri dish that we're growing in and we're, we're kind of like fizzing in until we grow up and out of it, maybe depending, or we stay in it, depending on what the body needs. I'm curious about uh, what, cause I have my own ideas I'm going to share in a moment, but what, what point did you start feeling in your body? Oh, I don't resonate with this term anymore. <laughs> That's such a great question. And it's something <laughs> that I, I still continue to work on all the time. I actually even can feel some tears here as you ask the question, which is fine. I'm just yeah. you know, and just noticing them and seeing with my body around that. Um, you know, I think that I, I have felt that dissonance always and forever <laughs> since coming back onto earth this time around. <laughs> 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 That's part of my human experience is, 
to uh, always sort of be searching for, you know, others who have that sense of, you know, a time maybe when we lived in more fullness with each other um, that I think is ancient and yet still clearly remembered in my body. So, um, you know, for example, there's a couple of other identities. For example, I've been sober for a very long time. And um, again, it was an identity. It was so important to me and, you know, kept me sober for a really long time. And, and yet always, even within the work that went into that and, you know, meetings and, you know, uh, community and, you know, feeling like I wanted to belong. There were always pieces where, oh my goodness, like the body is not being cared for here. Yeah, the body mind connection is not really happening here. And I need to go outside this construct to do that work. And um, also, uh, as I mentioned in education, you know, being an educator was a huge identity for me for a very long time. And I felt um, that I could surreptitiously you know do this work this mind body work in the classroom but always I felt sort of sad that it had to be surreptitious like like why can't this just be how you know we create learning environments that's whole body centered right and um and so I I've always felt the dissonance I'm I'm super sensitive and uh pay attention to my body. So I'm always, you know, feeling that. Um, I have to say that it's only since I became a somatic experiencing practitioner, as you are, that, uh, and started to uh, really know how to work with old trauma in my body. I had been working on it for years and years and years, but to really um, work with the nervous system to release that I began to see that these constructs and these identities were not helpful for me anymore. And that there was much more constriction trying to stay within those identities. And Ooh. yeah. I just wanted like, yeah. to have to hold that. That's so gorgeous. Like you notice there is more constriction trying to stay within those identities. Ah. Right, that's powerful because ah, it's... I'm just feeling <laughs> me yeah. too. Just because yeah. people listening might might be thinking, well, how did they learn that it wasn't <laughs> for? Well, constriction is the teacher. You know, when you feel that bracing happening over the body in relation to a construct or identity, it's incongruent with your present state. Right. Right. And I just like took a spontaneous deep breath as you said that which is one of my teachers now, you know, it's like, oh, and then this is what I teach in my SE sessions. It's like, oh, your body just took a spontaneous deep breath. Mm. There's comfort there. There's mm. identification there. There's release there. It's like, oh, I don't have to hold that restriction any longer. And yeah. And it's, it's really, I mean, doing somatic experiencing with myself and with people is, you know, recognizing it's so simple. It's recognizing when is there, Oh, what's feeling constricted and Oh, when is there release? And just sort of, it's that, that simple. You're, <laughs> that you're simple? right. It's that simple. <laughs> That's simple. And so, you know, in doing the somatic work um, with myself and with others, you know, really, um, just recognizing when I come from those old identities. I have to say what I love. I'm yeah. sorry. When you yeah. come from those old when identities, I come from those old identities in, in my, in my speaking, in my storytelling about myself, in my sharing, it's like, I notice the constriction. And when I go, oh, yes. yeah, here, here's the interesting thing. <clears throat> when I go beyond that, I often still notice constriction because I don't know <laughs> those identities yet. Yes. Learning. And in learning, there's a sense of non-safety and vulnerability. But what's what's important about that is 
so much is coming up as you're speaking. What's important about that is, uh, well, there's two parts. One part is I'm hearing so clearly, and I, I, I know this, but I'm really feeling it right now, is that the mind identity is born from mind, right? You know, presence and being is born from body, but identity is born from mind. And I'm noticing as you're talking about education, as you're talking about being in communities with witches over the years, you started noticing that there was more of a focus on identity and mind and less on body. And, and body is really what lights you up, like the relationship between the two, not one over the other, but the, the symbiosis, right? Yes. And, and what you just said was important. You know, we have identity because of what you just said. The infinite possibility of mystery is so terrifying to a little mortal body that identity gives us this temporary concept of I know something, right? I know what I am. I know what you are. I know what I'm having for breakfast. And it, it just tides us over <laughs> from the huge vastness of mystery, which is actually reality. So I love this awareness you just shared, the somatic awareness of, oh, certain identities constrict. And then when I move out of those identities, when I go really far beyond them, then my body constricts again because I'm in the unknown. <laughs> so it's like you're ping-ponging between identity and mystery. I mean, that's gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I like I like, and I don't like that you say ping-ponging. <laughs> <laughs> it's really true when it's you know when it's like ah you know like sort of well it's so much like chaos theory and boop 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 you know and getting comfortable with that um I I you know I I have this hope that it becomes more like riding the waves you know and um you know being a little more regulated in as opposed to the ping ponging though there's probably always going to be ping ponging and especially around something as huge as this infinite unknowingness and the restriction of human identity. <laughs> mm, oof. I mean, I just love this. It lights me up because yeah. I, I like the distinction between ping ponging and even pendulating or, you know, like, like regulation. Right. These waves of, oh, I touch into yeah. mystery, then I slowly go back to my container building capacity right. instead of the erratic ping ponging. And like you said, there's always going to be both, which I think is so yeah. humbling and honest. You know, I want to, I think I want to say that for, for those of us who, you know, I mean, I think a term that people can identify with is uh, our empaths. I mean, I understand that differently through the trauma perspective, but let's just say empaths and super sensitive to everything, which I, I hold that, I hold that identity <laughs> <laughs> in a loving way, you know, um, yeah. then, you know, the idea of riding waves or pendulation or regulation is very comforting because in the past, like before I knew as much as I did about uh, trauma and my nervous system, it, it, it would only be ping ponging and the ping ponging would come from fear, uh, fear mm -hmm. of the vast unknown or fear of the, you know, being a mere mortal. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's how I think, that's how I feel, that's how I experience life. And if that's so, if that's true, then, oh my goodness, are there, are there tools for sort of learning how to regulate or modulate or titrate a little bit, a little bit of whatever I'm needing to feel. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, those are the tools that I got from SE and use now. Um, so, yeah, so. Well, my, let's be there because when you said that, those are the tools I have from SE and use now. I have experienced the same thing as I was practicing, as I was studying, as I was holding space for others myself with these tools from somatic experiencing. I started noticing what I wanted to get from doing rituals as a witch in the past. I was getting with my own body through SE, right? Like these transformative transmutations of energy, of of the psychedelic experience of witnessing memories coming through my tissues, it's literally magic in the body and alchemy. Absolutely. And and right, and and that for me, this I'm speaking for myself, I'm curious about you. 
that seemingly mundane experience of touching into my body <laughs> yeah. like replaced the the kind of um dr dramatization we would do in ritual with like costumes and calling things in and uh, even the rules of positioning somewhere and leaving offerings which i respect greatly yet there is something so deep and so minimalist and so ancient about relating to my body that it just kind of replaced that naturally for me like what what was that like for you i'm curious well, you know, <laughs> we are the earth. We are the gods and goddesses. We are, you know, um, divinity, right? And I understand those earlier years when, um, you know, these gatherings were as powerful as they were for me. Uh, what I was coming into contact with was exactly that. And doing that like through a group and with a group and with the support of other people who practiced, right? And at, over the years, you know, learning that that's right here inside us and, you know, all of it, all of it, you know, every blade of grass, every seed, every, it's here, it's inside us, every, everything that we were uh, sort of um, honoring about the earth and, and the divinity uh, in all living beings, like is in here too, mm -hmm. which is in part why all interestingly while why so 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 many of these identities like kind of stopped working or or were no longer feeling congruent because the larger group I think kind of well it just I don't know if it went a went awry and uh, you know uh, stopped looking for that magical connection with life inherent um or if i was then able to do that on a deeper level for myself and so it didn't feel as powerful in the group anymore i don't really know that because, last thing you just said that was my yeah. experience yeah i mean because it but here's for me now like it's it's happened in you know in uh 12 step constructs for me yes. which still is, are incredibly important to my life and i I honor them and things have changed around that identity and in education, you know, and, you know, in, and just kind of watching so, so many, so many changes, um, you know, around uh, different community and identity uh, organizations, I guess, yeah. structures. Yeah. I agree so much because uh, even how you said it happened in other constructs with you and for you, you, you named AA. I, it was like simultaneous for me as the witch construct was just dissolving naturally. I, it wasn't a rejection. It was just a dissolving. It, at the same time, these constructs that I was given from psychologists were dissolving. Oh, um, okay. like, yes. <laughs> like, like, like having Tourette syndrome, ADHD, all which is biologically true, but yes. the, the construct dissolved. Um, childhood survivor of sexual assault, that dissolved. I noticed when I was with these identities I was given, these diagnoses I was given, the constriction, just like with which. And, and that's because presently in this moment, I am none of those things. Yeah. It's like it was something that happened to my body, but I'm not that thing. Yeah. Right. And so it, embodiment, <laughs> embodiment practices through SE have have they gifted me such like a um a tangible sensational experience of present that I'm so much more aware of construct is just about past and future. It's not really like when you're in that nanosecond of present, it doesn't exist. It's like there is no identity in the present until you identify <laughs> and the identity comes from the past or future. So I'm saying this to kind of set up a question in my exuberance. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'm curious about I'm curious about how do you, okay, how do you experience the loss of constructs while still feeling centered? And I ask that question because you and I have been in similar groups over the years where you can see someone losing identity um, through drug, through ecstatic trance, and they're dissociated. And it's, it's this idea of I lost identity or I'm healing, but it's really like I'm out of my body, I'm not in it. So tell us the difference. <laughs> the, the question changed. 
<laughs> that's my brand. <laughs> that's how this brain works. And I'm going to decide which question I'm going to go with. You decide, please. Um, well, I think what, what comes up first for me is um, I was there. I, I did that. I, a part of the time that I was in that identity and, you know, and sort of trancing ecstatically and oh my God, it was wonderful and incredible, but it wasn't necessarily healing, right? It wasn't. And, um, and it, it is and was, and I'm owning it, a form of uh, spiritual bypassing, which I can sometimes feel something about like, I don't know, is it guilt? Is it shame? I, it's something. I'm not sure it's either of those two things, but something like that, you know, oh my God, that wasn't my intention. Okay. That wasn't my intention, but let's own it. That's, that's, that's where your body was at. That's, that's what you knew then. Right. So there's, there's a way that I want to and do work with accountability around that, you know, and then it's like, and, and what now? And so part of what now in realizing, okay, that's not what I do now, is this huge loss that's sometimes unbearable, feels unbearable. It's not unbearable. It feels unbearable. You know, if, if, if that's not what I'm doing anymore, and that's what other people at gatherings are doing, like, what's my place here? What do I do here? You know, and it kind of depends on the balance of, you know, how many people are really tending to their body, mind, and finding, knowing, you know, spirit and divinity through embodiment, and how many are practicing other ways, you yeah. know. So, um, and again, in all of these identities, you know, all the ones I've mentioned, uh, I, I, I feel that same like loss because I'm stepping away. You know, one of the favorite pieces of work I do with somatic experiencing, and I talk about it all the time, is when it comes to trauma, you want to, you know, touch and step back touch and step back it's pendulation but before somebody can understand pendulation or like applying pendulation it's like that's my go-to sort of motto you know just touch and step back and so I think for a number of years with these identities I would like touch and then step back when it felt overwhelming or I was seeing something that wasn't working for me anymore you know and so over time I found that I've stepped back a lot more than I'm still touching, <laughs> you know, I'm not touching in as much. I'm stepping back and feeling, well, what's, what, what comes up when I'm stepping back and not doing what isn't re a release for me. What, when I'm, when I'm moving away from the constriction. And so there's a lot of sadness and a lot of grieving and, um, and a sort of a, I can feel my nervous system like kind of scouting around for, well, where, where can I find community and activities with others who are, you know, doing the work that I'm doing and understanding the things that I'm, I'm understanding because that's what's important to me. Does that answer the question? <laughs> it, I mean, it goes beyond, um, <laughs> gratefully because, uh, I think what I love about that is that the, there's so much nuance in that, which is when I walk away from identity, which constricts me, let's say I'm constricted. I want to kind of free myself from the identity that constricts me. I start to walk away. There's this inherent grief with that because there's a loss of something you've always known. There's a loss of connection to certain people that you shared identity with. There's so many losses that come from that walking away, you know, death, if you will as you're simultaneously building capacity for this new space without the identity. And when you're talking about the touching in and coming out, touching in and coming out, I mean, you're, you're really teaching us. That's one of the ways we build capacity. We don't build capacity by staying away. That's avoidance. And we don't build capacity by diving in and dissociating, right? That's just dissociation. We build it by, I touch it. I notice my limit. I pull back and digest. Then my limit gets a little bigger and I touch back in, pull back and digest. So I just appreciated those how those two are related. The grief 
of walking away from identity and that touch and go with what's new. Yeah. I'm curious how you might have answered your question yourself. I don't remember it now. <laughs> oh, okay. fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't either yeah. exactly, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'm so more interested in what you just said that I forgot it. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I think yeah. though, you know, even though I, I don't remember the exact words, <clears throat> I remember the curious, the feel, I can feel the curiosity in me, you know, yeah. from where it came from. Yeah, yeah. And I think my curiosity for you was, and what you said it really just noticing the difference of is what I'm doing, um, nurturing my ability to be with parts of myself, or is what I'm doing helping me avoid parts of myself? Yeah, and, yeah. And I think that's what my curiosity was. Yeah, and I think I, I think I, I felt the curiosity of the question. Yeah, more than the words, which is great, and uh, you know, answered from that place because I know you're doing this work too, and otherwise our conversation couldn't be so rich. So you're having your own experience of identity and, and changes and transitions and loss. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, just people listening, because we have to close soon. What, what, what kind of work are you offering? How do people find you? Like, tell us a little bit about your practice. Oh, thank you for asking. I'm so excited about my practice. Yeah. So um, my business name is Taproot Access Coaching. And I, uh, so I, I'm a, a coach, a resiliency and trauma coach, and I focus as much on resilience as I do on the trauma because it's about the healing. And um, I use somatic experiencing and all these other things, all these other uh, pieces that I've learned from these other identities that we've talked about, you know, it's all coming together um, to do, um, you know, sessions. I tend to work with uh, people who are just coming out of freeze uh, and that ha haven't known that their, you know, bodies, minds, you know, just kind of been shut down and, and just very restricted. And so as you begin to sort of just barely open that up, like what are, what are the things that can happen? What are the releases you can make? How, what are the tools that you can use on a regular basis when you're not working with me? That's so important to me is teaching those skills for you know, independent resilience, right? <laughs> and um, I also have been doing this interesting work, um, uh, looking at uh, a twelve-step work through uh, through a trauma lens, and that's been fascinating, and, and it's fed me on a personal level as well. Um, I do, you know, I do work with uh, people who have experienced all different kinds of abuse. Um, again, it used to be very focused in my mind on uh, sexual abuse and sexual assault. And, you know, that identity has sort of dissolved. It's, it's, it's there and I, and I, you know, use that in my work with people, but it isn't sort of a primary um, thing. I have recently worked, um, I've, I've recently gone to a training, uh, Eye of the Needle. I don't know if you're familiar with Eye of the Needle work. Yeah, I am. I, I, I want to go to the training. I haven't gone to yet. Oh, it's amazing. And th this happened to be with Peter Levine, which was, you know, a wonderful experience and Josh Silvey. And um, <clears throat> it was amazing. And it's working with uh, the nervous system state around um, near death experiences. And so there is a focus on what you might expect near death experiences to be like surgery has gone bad or anesthetic states but really one of the things I learned is how many people how many people have had near-death experiences that wouldn't necessarily be recognized as that or fit in the categories and yet their bodies went to that state of near-death experience and so that's brought more uh, touch work <clears throat> into play for me which I'm really loving um, most of my business is uh, on online, so I can't do touch work. Well, you do mediated touch work online, but you know it's mostly local people in in Vermont who come and and work with me um, in person. But uh, I do a lot. I do all of my work. You know, ninety five percent of my work um, online on Zoom. So if people uh, want to check me out, they can go to my website, which is taprootaccesscoaching.com and uh find out more about me there yeah 
Beautiful. Thank, thank you. And I just, I've loved this conversation yeah. and I'm, I'm really Super. excited for people to hear it. Yeah, that's so great. Thank you so much for asking. And good to see you as always. You too, my love. Ooh. That's the end of today's episode. Now let's take a moment to notice where we feel the episode in our bodies. Close your eyes. Take a breath. And let whatever wants to come up, come up. And remember, those sensations hold the wisdom that we're looking for. If you want to go deeper, visit holisticlifenavigation.com. Ooh.